this wonderful expression by Lewis, put down the burden of hatred. You know, it's a burden, it's crushing you. The first will be Professor Jason Blakely of Pepperdine University, and his, his book is called We Built Reality. The second are Professors Patricia Nance and Charles Taylor, and we'll be discussing their book, Reconstructing Democracy. I think that oftentimes uh, there are habits of mind and reading that come from the natural sciences, where we read the social sciences as though the, the object of study out there is in a kind of splendid isolation. I wanted to take up an interpretive or hermeneutic perspective. Then what starts to become apparent is that the word object relationship is different. The descriptions and theories can actually enter into identities, self-understandings, and even re radical restructurings of the entire world we live in. I don't use the word neoliberalism. I use the term the market polis, a rational choice theory, which is the sort of model or idealized conception of agency that comes out of neoclassical economics. There's a notion of selfhood that um, comes out of these models. At the popular level, when these theories get vulgarized, you end up with certain slogans. A government is always inefficient. Now, if you press people popularly, why do you, how do you know? They'll tell you, well, there's a science that says it. So I talk in the book about the invention of a discursive concept, the economy, with the definite article, the economy is in, we all know what we're referring to just as a descriptive concept. It often includes things like GDP, unemployment rate, other things are excluded, homelessness, uh, entrenched poverty, ecological devastation. Those don't count as part of the economy. You'll lasso the economy in a kind of correlation, or maybe you'll fudge it and say it's a causation with, say, incumbency. And you'll say, hey, this president really ran the economy extremely well, such that you might even end up in a place where you say, hey, he or she is a white nationalist, but look what a great job they did with the economy. And what you end up with is an entire different practice of statecraft that's more like market craft built around a supposedly objective descriptive claim but that actually excludes in its social metaphysics other aspects of political life. A statistical conception of criminality where you had certain behavioral inputs, social, genetic, uh, personal history. If you had enough of these inputs, you could stack uh, the probability of someone being criminal so high that it almost became, they became hopelessly criminal just as a probabilistic thing. The predator was often a um, racialized other, a black or Hispanic male, who was so statistically hopelessly criminal that the only thing you could do is enact um, certain types of policing that were highly militarized. Um, you know, if you've got someone who social scientifically, supposedly, is so hopelessly criminal, then it's naive to try to educate them out of it. Populism today, Trump, Marine Le Pen, is really uh, based on the fact that a lot of people in our Western democracies have had their standard of living decline. That is the idea that this is all really the fault of, in some sense or other, outsiders. In a lot of societies where there's a kind of caste-like understanding that some people should come first and some other people second and other people third. So the idea is that you appeal to people in the sort of middle of the hierarchy saying that the people that are on the bottom are getting a lot of privileges which you should be given. And the corrupt elites are people who favor those uh, people on the uh, lower level as against you honest uh, Americans or Brits or, or French and so on. One of the conditions of it all working is total opacity of the democratic political system. By opacity, I mean, what levers do I use to change the situation? If you like, the opacity goes along with what I want to call a sense of citizen inefficacy. A great unspoken secret of all this is that the remedies recommended by Trump and Le Pen, apart from being, you know, ethically repulsive, actually wouldn't help. How to best combat this, not by more th good theory, I mean, it helps them with theory, but by mobilizing. This, this has to happen on the global level, on the national level. This should also happen on the local level, because there are things that can be done on the local level that can't be done uh, simply on the national level. Two ways to create greater transparency and greater sense of what the levers are. One is the organization of a local community. Several things begin to happen. First of all, they begin to get to know each other and trust each other. And secondly, they have a, begin to have a program. And thirdly, they begin to have a sense of what to do. You actually get people to come to understand 
each other. It's one of the most tragic things in our world today is the way people caricature the other, completely caricature, and think that they've got an understanding of it. This, you know, the kind of democracy that Hannah Arendt was talking about, we talk to each other, really get to, to listen to each other, and we can work out together in mutual respect what the best solution is for all of us. Uh, as we see with the pandemic uh, of the coronavirus, there's a, uh, an increasing sort of um, sort of dysfunctional uh, working of the government, not only for the pandemic, but for many, for the climate change, for many complex issues. It's, it's a question of um, capacity of steering at the system level. There are two main uh, reasons why we uh, went to look at the local level. One is because it seems that federal political government is much more unable to solve problems than at the local level. So they would need to sort of tickle upwards from the bottom so that political, uh, the political realm at the federal level would be able to learn from all these different uh, solutions at the bottom because it's, it's very abstract and they very seldom see what, they, uh, what the consequence of, of federal politics is for the local community. It's, it's important to understand that there are different traditions between the US and Europe. In Europe, the state plays a much bigger role. I just give you an, an, question or an, an example of Ireland, where the first um, sort of very famous uh, citizen assembly took place in 2013 and then 15 and 16. Uh, and it was about, the most prominent example was about an amendment of the constitution for the same-sex marriage, which was a hugely controversial issue in the Catholic island. And through this uh, randomly selected citizen assembly with around 100 uh, citizens, they really managed to come to, uh, to a consensus nearly, or at least more than two-thirds of the, not only of citizen assembly, but then in the referendum, it was the exact number of the population to be for an amendment of the constitution and for same-sex marriage. The government and parliament in particular was very much involved in the design and also there was a strong political will for participation. What we are asking for is to have a network of all these kind of processes, self-organized and uh, top-down organized, so that in the end, perhaps we have something like a fourth branch of state power with in-depth consultations to make politics better and to make democracy livelier. Technocracy or rule by this kind of epistemic attempt, mission impossible by the way, to reduce human agency to mechanism, um, doesn't just exist up here amongst elites talking. At the local level, one of the things that's trickled down is a way of talking. I'm interested by this notion of techno-populism. The call is for a kind of technocratic conception of the market. I think there's an opacity there that Charles was talking about really in an interesting way to me, um, where people don't understand that the market doesn't spontaneously happen, that in fact states engineer and create markets in all sorts of ways. I must say I'm tremendously inspired by Jason's book. The entire approach of the people that, that, that Jason takes apart so well, it's all some kind of trick that they find, or some kind of special lever that they find. Charles, this idea of uh, the stories that you tell, I mean, in some ways, uh, the, the, critic, the critic in me is tempted to say, well, these are just idealized examples. You, you have to select to tackle the problem are people from lots of different media and background because they have the expertise, the insight, the knowledge, and, or you need the consent in order to get a plan together and send it up. My conviction is that one of the ways of defeating that bad kind of mobilization is to get people involved in the other kind of mobilization where the people they need to speak to and get the consent, and that forces them out of their, uh, what is the word, bubble, echo chamber, and so on. I would like to um, just tell you a very brief story about the, the French um, Citizen Assembly. I mean, given that it was by selected by random, and what is interesting that the whole bunch of 150 people had to re somehow represent the whole France. And what happened is first, people started to, became, uh, to become an ex experts on climate change over the year they had worked on these issues. The second is that they, they speak to each other uh, uh, for, coming from different milieus and they would never have spoken to each other otherwise. There's this sociologist at UCLA, Aaron Panofsky, he's got this term I find helpful, astrological genetics. 
he argues that there, there's a way of reading bodies that's kind of super, not kind of, it's superstitious. I mean, if you used to be born under the sign, say Libra or Leo, now you're born under the sign black or Hispanic or white. And what people are doing at the popular level is actually sort of reading bodies. There's a problem of education, say, as well as a problem of leisure, frankly. Americans have much less leisure. So we're just trying to survive, a lot of us, um, the market polis, and we don't really have time to do the Tocqueville thing. They're both the kinds of gettings together that we are describing and the ones that Jason is describing are happening at the same time. People are definitely organizing around white supremacy. There's something, I think, deeper always going on here. When you look at uh, things like Martin Luther King and, and uh, John Lewis and so on, they really had an insight that the people that were making li their lives very difficult, they're, they're imprisoned in this kind of idea that the blacks are lower. It's a wonderful expression by uh, Lewis, put down the burden of hatred. And he's from, you know, it's a burden, it's crushing you. It, once you kind of make the shift over into hermeneutics and interpretivism, um, even technocracy is just repressed meanings. It's repressed interpretations. Yeah. See, I was really intrigued by this notion of an ethnographic um, facilitator that Charles and Patricia talk about. If you want to speak in terms of the academy, is we need to have more of what I call the ethnographic mindset. I mean, I'm very impressed, for instance, with a book like Artie Hochschild's uh, Strangers in a Strange Land. You know, that's why here I think I'm very much in, in sync and sympathy with Jason. I find this kind of ethnographic way of doing social science <laughs> has much greater depth and interest and richness than let's find this one trick, you know, this one, let's say everybody's trying to maximize something, trying to maximize X or Y, and, and you just get absolutely nowhere with that. I mean, it, it, you know, it bores me terrible to have to read that, but, but Jason points out that it's not only boring, it's dangerous. Human beings as self-interpreting storytelling animals, this is the humbling part. I think there's an epistemic humility in hermeneutics, which is that if you live stories, you're going to have to kind of come to grips with the fact that there's not the scientifically official story. You're going to have to have dialogue, debate, uncomfortable moments as a human being about which story to live. What role does the Christian community have in building this kind of community? We certainly face um, times where we don't know. Uh, we are in the middle of a fog because a paradigm is going to finish soon, it seems, it's still struggling to stay in power, but we don't know what will, the future will be. We don't, we don't know exactly what the new paradigm is all about. But orientation is the most important thing you can de deliver. Uh, holding the space for finding together uh, a common orientation would, I think, be the role of all churches. My sense is that the Catholic Church is split up into affinity parishes, which would have great trouble sitting down together but we don't have the structures that bring us together because we don't have any decision-making structures that are not top-down. Mm -hmm. That is one of our big problems. So I think the, you know, the great uh, abiding problem of the Catholic Church since way back in the Middle Ages has been this kind of, mon well, papal mon monarchism, or if you like, total top-downism and so on. You know, this is doing this immense harm I think all the time. And it's something that we really have to address at some point. You know, our political communities ultimately fail us, uh, period, because we're finite, um, because the universe is finite, because our projects are finite. And one of the things that's fascinating about Jesus is that in the Gospels, his parables are always about a kingdom that's on the way, it's coming into the world, but I'm also always just walking toward it. Um, it gives a time horizon to accompaniment and to who belongs to you that's different than politics at the same time that it intermixes with our politics. The churches have a role to play in this sort of, um, that, that even supersedes or goes beyond any polity, which is in what it means to belong to each other even beyond politics. And when we failed at politics, um, and one of the things I find uh, interesting or attractive and weird about this first century Jewish person, Jesus, uh, is that he has this notion of community that always goes further than I'm willing to go. Nothing restores democracy like democracy. <laughs>